Okay, let's begin. I think we've got a good number of participants and there'll still be a few more minutes while I introduce everyone. So thank you very much. Welcome to this one hour webinar on defending data protection litigation. Thank you so much for joining us. Now we've had more than 400 people register to join us today, which I think is a record for Cornerstone. And we've been running these events for almost two years. Uh, and we've got organisations from Durham to the Isle of Wight, East Anglia to West Wales. Um, and I think that shows just how important this issue's become for organisations across the country. Now, you'll remember when the GDPR came into force about four years ago, it attracted a remarkable amount of attention and I think revealed a lot of confusion and misunderstanding. So it's not surprising that in the last few years, data protection litigation has become a growth area and organisations are understandably concerned about how to deal with this tidal wave of claims. So in the last few months alone, I think I've probably dealt with um, at least one of these cases a week on average. So there's a lot of work out there, a lot of claims to deal with. Now, the focus of this session will be on the kinds of claims that we know from our clients that they're dealing with most often. So they're low value, low complexity claims, usually resulting from an accidental personal data breach. So while there will be inevitably some discussion of the law, our aim is to share our experience and to give you practical, straightforward tips for making these claims go away at the lowest possible cost. So joining me uh, today for this session are two of my more dazzling colleagues, and all three of us are members of the Cornerstone Barristers Information Law team. So firstly, uh, Christina Leonen. She is a public law specialist and a highly regarded legal academic. She has a PhD in constitutional law from UCL in London, and she's also currently a lecturer at the University of Law. And she has a book on constitutional rights, which is due to be published later this year. Um, she joined us at Cornerstone in 2019, and she trained with some of the leading lights uh, at the Information Law Bar, Philip Koppel, QC, and the wonderful Estelle Dehon, who is soon to be made a QC. If you've been paying attention to the news flashes on our website, you might have spotted that. So also with us is John Fitzsimons. John is a data protection expert. He teaches the data protection essential knowledge course for PDP in the UK and in Ireland. And he's spoken several times at the annual PDP data protection conference. Um, he's also an expert contributor to Peter Carey's book, Data Protection, a Practical Guide to the UK Law, which at the time of speaking has 4.7 stars on Amazon. And someone called Tickled Pink wrote in a glowing review that it's by far the best written uh, book. Some of the others have been an absolute chore to read. Um, so he's also believed, I think, to be in the top 10 tallest barristers currently practicing in England and Wales. So what will, be, will we be discussing in the next hour or so? Um, Christina, if you can click over, please. Thank you. So firstly, Christina will be looking at responding to claims, and that will include a tour of four essential cases that were decided last year in the courts. Then John will share his tips on strategies for handling a case once it gets to court. And finally, I will look at compensation and try to answer the 2% of annual global turnover question, how much are these claims really worth? Now, at the end of the session, we'll have about 10 minutes for a Q&A session. Thanks to those of you who've submitted questions in advance, we will try to deal with them in our presentations, but any leftover we will try to answer in the final part of the session. Um, and with that introduction, thank you very much. I will hand over to Christina. Thank you, Matt, and good morning, everyone. Um, so on this slide, you have the four cases that Matt just mentioned. Uh, these are all high court decisions from 2021. Uh, the ones that I've written there in blue uh, will uh, link you directly to the Bailey um, judgment. Uh, the Ashley judgment is not available on Bailey, that, but it can be found on Westlaw. I will just very quickly run you through the, uh, the facts in these cases so that they're fresh in everyone's minds. Um, because I think all of us will refer to them uh, at least to, to some extent. Um, the defendant in this case, in, in the Warren case, um, is a, a national retailer um, that runs Curry's, um, and they have been the victim of a cyber attack. And the claimant was saying that as part of that attack, um, his name, address, uh, phone number and date of birth, as well as his email address had been obtained. And uh, the claim was for damages in the amount of £5,000. Uh, and he pleaded um, reliance on um, what has now become a sort of typical combination of causes of action 
uh, i.e. breach of confidence, uh, misuse of private information, breach of the Data Protection Act of 1998, and common law negligence. As was the case in all of these four cases, uh, the defendant made an application uh, for strike out and or summary judgment. And that's really where, um, that's really what the judgment is concerned with. Um, the court very helpfully um, clarified that where a case is concerned with an alleged failure to keep personal data secure from unauthorized third party access. So we're not dealing with a situation where, for example, an email has been sent accidentally, but where um, there was unauthorized third party access to data, that cannot amount in law to a breach of confidence or misuse of private information. And so those causes of action um, were struck out. Likewise, and this is a theme that we can see um, through all of the judgments, um, it is probably, I think, in my view, fair to say that after these four judgments, claimants will no longer be able, uh, to the extent that they were ever able to do so in the first place, to rely on common law negligence for these types of claims. Uh, the courts have categorically said in all of these cases um, that that is not uh, a proper basis uh, because no duty exists in the first place. Uh, and in most of these cases, you wouldn't be able um, to plead uh, psychiatric illness or other types of personal injury types of um, damage. And so therefore the negligence claim was struck out as well and only the data protection principle uh, claim survived. Interesting fact, um, pure legal, um, they're the solicitor's firm that um, supported the claimant's claim. They were last year the, uh, the law firm with the highest number of claims having been brought uh, in the media of, and communications list um, at the high court um, for data protection breach types of claims. Uh, and they have, uh, since the judgment was handed down, and I'm not suggesting there's a causal link, but they were placed in administration by the High Court in November of last year. So it'll be interesting to see what that means for these types of cases, um, who will pick up those cases. And uh, I thought just to share that information in case some of you were involved in cases uh, involving pure legal. Then we have Johnson and Eastlight. Here the defendant was the claimant's landlord. Uh, one of their other tenants had requested a rent statement and was sent the claimant's statement instead, and so the claimant's name email address and recent rent payments um, uh, were made available to that person. Everything was um, deleted uh, within a day's time and the defendant informed the claimant. Nonetheless, the claimant uh, brought a claim for an injunction, a declaration and damages um, not exceeding 3,000 uh, pounds. The defendant again made an application for strikeout and or a summary judgment. Um, and the judge here very helpfully um, indicated that claims that are only collateral to any GDPR claims, or now UK GDPR claims, um, are likely going to be seen to be obstructing uh, the just disposal um, of, of these types of proceedings and should therefore be struck out. Um, and the, the question whether the claimant in this case uh, was entitled to purely nominal or extremely low damages was to be determined um, by the county court. Then we have the case of Rolfe. Um, so here we have uh, the defendants who were a, uh, a, a law firm, the solicitor's firm, I believe, um, and they um, represented an educational trust, again by accident, so sort of classic of the genre. Uh, an email was sent to the incorrect recipient, the claimant's names, address, and account of school fees was disclosed, and the information showed that um, they were owing the school fees. Um, again, the data breach was dealt with very, very quickly, um, but nonetheless, the claimants, so all of the um, family members, in fact, brought claims for damages in an unspecified amount, and they also asked for a declaration and an injunction, um, pleading the, as I said, well-established combination um, of, of causes of action. Um, they said that the data breach had made them feel ill, uh, and that was in part due to the fear of the unknown. Uh, the def defendants applied for summary, summary judgment, and this is the strongest of the four cases in that the court dismissed the case in its entirety. Um, I think it's fair to say that the judge was not very imp impressed with this claim um, and clearly thought 
uh, that the claim was exaggerated and that, that it lacked any credible evidence um, of distress and was, um, was speculative um, in nature. Um, the, uh, the judgment includes a helpful reference um, by Master McLeod to uh, another case, a High Court decision of, of 2011, um, the Ambrosiadu case, um, where Lord Neuberger, who was a Court of Appeal judge at the time, um, uh, sort of goes into the notion of what it means to, to live in the, in the 21st century and uh, with the sorts of technological challenges that that might bring and um, the sort of fortitude and, and reasonable um, um, reasonable ability one would expect of a person to, to, to be able to handle these types of breaches. And, and that is um, also reflected in, uh, in the quote um, by, um, by Master McLeod that is on the slide here. Finally, then, we have Ashley and Amplifon. Now, this is an, an extremely interesting case, um, not just because I think it must be one of the first cases that was actually um, brought on the basis of the UK GDPR, um, but more so because it, it has a lot to say about what to do when, uh, at the point in time when the breach has occurred. So here the defendant was the claimant's previous employer. Um, at the time of the breach, there was already uh, an employment dispute in the background. And so that, that's an additional factor um, that the court had to look at. Um, the employer accidentally sent the employment contract to another employee, and that employee then informed the claimant that they had received it. The claimant contacted the HR department, so all of this was claimant-driven rather than defendant-driven, um, and they replied the same day. However, um, you'll see here in the quote, um, so all of this was, was discussed in, in, in quite some detail in the judgment, which I encourage you to read, um, that they will reach out to the person who had received that other person's, the claimant's information by accident, and that they will put measures in place uh, to prevent this from occurring again. So all of this essentially saying, we will do something about it. However, it then appears that the, the, the claimant never heard about it again. Uh, he had no idea what had happened. Um, I, I, if I remember correctly, I think it was only at the time the defense was filed that he was actually shown the email by the other employee confirming um, that he had deleted um, the information. And so months and months had passed without any communication between the defendant and the claimant. Um, the claim was, was brought and the claim for negligence was again uh, was against struck out. The breach of confidence claim was said to add nothing to the claim for the breach of the UK GDPR or the tort of misusing uh, private information. Um, but the judge uh, essentially uh, transferred the, the case to the county court, small claims track, um, due to there being this uncertainty around what had actually happened at the time of breach, how was it rectified, um, how did it make the claimant um, feel at the time, and was that justified? Basically, not all of the facts had been established, and so uh, the judge felt that the um, the claim should proceed to trial so that all of those facts could then be established um, uh, through disclosure and cross-examination. On the basis of all of these cases, I've put together a sort of action plan, if you will, um, that you can use um, to, to essentially try to get things right from the start. Because uh, in my view, if you invest um, time at the beginning when a breach um, comes to light, if you act promptly, you take the matter seriously and you can show that you take the matter seriously. So if you make sure that you have the evidence, if it does come um, to a lawsuit, um, then that will um, obviously put you in a very good position to defend these types of uh, claims. So um, the Ashley case clearly shows that a simple apology won't do. It will not be enough to say we will do something in the future. If you do say that, uh, then please do follow up. Um, but in general, I think you should, without any delay, uh, first of all, rectify the breach. And if the personal data was inadvertently sent to the wrong person, um, in my view, it would be prudent to ask them by email. Um, so in, in Ashley, a phone call was made, which there wasn't then any record of for the judge to see. Ask them by email not to read or to open any attachment that might have been sent inadvertently to delete the information that they receive and to confirm to you in writing as soon as possible 
uh, whether they have read it, that they have deleted it, including from their trash or deleted items folder, and that they have not passed it on to others. What we see in quite a few of these claims is claimants saying, well, I'm not really sure. I know that that person deleted it, but what if they've done anything with it um, prior to, to deleting it, for example? So if you can get that um, confirmed, uh, I think that that would be very helpful. Um, I would then ask, uh, advise you to record what you have done to rec rectify the breach and consider also if you can produce any evidence to show that the breach was a one-off. Um, step five is then to inform the potential claimant uh, in writing again and as quickly as possible um, that of the steps that you have taken uh, when you took them and why the systems that you have in place uh, will ensure that a similar mistake won't happen again. Um, for reasons I'll um, mention briefly, um, very shortly, I think it is also advisable to check uh, online whether the data that was inadvertently disclosed was at that time freely available online, and if so, to make a record of that. If you follow these steps, um, and I'm not saying that this, these steps should be followed in each and every data breach case. John will say a few more things about um, the sort of threshold that a breach needs to cross to be reportable to the ICO, but arguably also um, for you to have to notify the data subject of it. Um, but assuming that you have a breach that needs to be communicated to the data subject, if you follow those steps, you may in fact sufficiently reassure the data subject, who may of course, um, be worried and legitimately worried about their data, uh, thereby avoiding litigation in the first place. Um, it can also help, I think, to, uh, to paint in a certain picture um, in front of the judge. Um, it might not directly influence the decision, but if you can show that you have proper steps in place and that everything was dealt with um, correctly and swiftly, I think that, that, that puts you in a, um, in, a, in a good position as a starting point. Um, help you put forward your best case as far as compensation is concerned. Um, this is uh, uh, an interesting um, point that um, if we look at the, if we look at the uh, Johnson case, um, there Master Thornet um, looked quite carefully, for example, at the claimant's allegation um, of distress and placed weight on the fact that, that the person had, she herself had essentially made her address publicly available by bringing the proceedings and filling in certain um, forms. And so um, following these steps and seeing what information is already out there um, might help sort of um, uh, contextualize how much, how much distress there really uh, ought to be in light of what's already out there. Uh, it will help you prove your case. So in Ashley and Amplifon, um, clearly the, the main reason, in my view, the case went to trial is that the evidence base wasn't properly established because the defendant couldn't show this is what we did, this is what happened, and therefore it's not a problem. And so um, to taking these steps will help you do that and will also help you narrow down the factual issues to be determined, which will then uh, make it more likely for, for example, um, uh, a summary judgment application to be successful. My final slide, um, a few other um, pre-action matters. So for data protection breaches, the limitation period is six years. Bear in mind though, that if a claim is brought under the Human Rights Act, so Article 8 being the sort of classic candidate for, for these types of claims, um, the limitation period for that um, is, is one year. Um, what we would advise you to do is to, um, rather than finding yourself in the, in the situation where there's a lot of back and forth between, between you and solicitors on the other side is to send a relatively robust uh, response to any pre-action letter and to discuss things, um, for example, such as forum. Again, John will explain this in, in a little bit more detail, but do make sure that you, you state from the beginning that the correct forum for these types of claims is the county court, um, not the high court. Um, as far as pre-action disclosure is concerned, um, we're of the view that um, obviously uh, your um, privacy notice or policy um, can and should be disclosed. However, um, lots of the other things that um, claimant solicitors typically ask for, and you, you might have seen a long list of all the sorts of things that, that they would wish to see to uh, assess their claim properly, um, that is probably disproportionate. And again, the, the court in Johnson 
um, made it quite clear that for you to um, sort of reflect on how much distress this has caused you, you do not need to know the ins and outs of what that organization, what measures that organization has in place to deal with data protection breaches. For causes of action, um, take a view. If you think that um, the UK GDPR or the GDPR or whatever was um, applicable at the relevant moment in time, whether there is a breach, and if that is the case, it is highly likely in light of these judgments that you can take, take the view and communicate the view that any other causes of action uh, pleaded or were raised in pre-action correspondence are likely going to be um, superfluous and the court may um, strike them out at, at, at a sensible time. Finally, as for settlement, so um, you are likely um, going to get, probably sooner rather than later, but at some point, you are likely to get a Part 36 offer um, from the claimant solicitors. And one of the reasons that that is so attractive to them is that um, under Part 36 of the civil procedure rules, if you accept a Part 36 offer, you are liable to pay, uh, to pay the claimant's uh, legal fees. And you may have seen in these types of cases, they can be of, of a sort of dimension that might not necessarily um, render them proportionate. So I think in the, in the Johnson case, I think the damages claim was valued at £3,000 and the solicitors had filed a, 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 the Form H where they indicated that they expected their top total costs to run to £50,000. Um, so just be mindful of the cost consequences attached to um, Part 36 offers. And in general, and I think uh, both of my colleagues will, will touch on this, um, in general, uh, you, you may want to wish to take a view at this point whether you want to make these types of claims go away or perhaps take a more strategic long-term uh, point of view and see whether uh, a case might add to the growing body of case law um, where the courts can set out the very helpful limitations um, for, for these types of claims. Uh, I won't read out this slide, it's just a point on pleadings, basically declarations and injunctions uh, are, uh, as a default position, uh, unsuitable for these types of claims. Uh, damages are enough. And with that, I hand over to John. Thank you, Christina. Just forgot to unmute myself after two years of doing these. Um, I'm going to look now at litigation strategy. Um, because, uh, you know, despite your best efforts, sometimes these claims don't settle and the claimant decides to go ahead and issue. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to pick up on one or two things that Christina touched on in relation to pre-action stage matters, which I want to endorse and emphasize. The first is please, please, please always ask yourselves when things go wrong or appear to go wrong, is it actually a data breach within the meaning of the UK GDPR or the 2018 Act? please don't rush in. And we know from the LGBT Foundation and Scott decision in 2020, and um, that oral disclosures, so disclosures over the telephone, they're not a breach of the Data Protection Act. They might be cause other, uh, lead to other causes of action, but they're not a breach of the Data Protection Act. And of course, we, we often see where um, data has been shared without someone's consent, that there's allegedly a breach of the Data Protection Act, but there may be other legal bases or exemptions for why personal data has been shared that legitimize the sharing and mean that you actually haven't breached the Data Protection Act. So just always be careful about was it actually a breach uh, before you, before you um, make any determinations. The second is that even if it is a breach, ask yourselves, is it a reportable breach? Because remember, you're only obliged to report a data breach to a data subject when it's likely to result in a high risk to the rights and freedoms of a data subject. And if you're curious about what a high risk will be, there's guidance from the European Data Protection Board, which I'm going to drop in the chat uh, when I finish off uh, this discussion. Because I see far too many claims that are issued off the back of a, of a claim being reported to a data uh, subject by someone without any legal knowledge in the area who thinks, oh, we should just tell the data subject about this issue but it's not actually a, a, a reportable breach and they could have avoided all of the stress and difficulties that arise had they not told the data subject because they were under no obligation to do so. If you do choose to notify the data subject, 
Uh, you need to be asking yourselves, and Christine touched on this, how do you avoid distress through the notification itself? You need to be notifying in a careful and sensitive way. Um, I recently uh, had a client to notify the data subject over telephone that there'd been a data breach, but they didn't specify exactly what personal data had been lost. And the data subject uh, ended the call thinking that uh, all of her financial data had been lost, but actually it was just her address. Uh, and so again, that claim ballooned into something much larger than it would have been had um, the, the correct uh, notification been made in the first instance. And also you want to think about how can you be helpful to the data subject without implying liability. Again, I've seen some clients who can be quite heavy handed with this, where they, as soon as they identify a data breach and, and see that it's reportable, they will send a, a settlement offer to a data subject straight away uh, with all sorts of legalese clauses, asking them to sign up to it. Um, and I think that's the type of thing that for, makes a data subject go running into the arms of a, a claimant solicitor uh, asking, you know, should I be more concerned about this? What's going on with this? So just be careful with that type of thing. And then thirdly, as Christina said, with Part 36 offers, uh, be cautious of the ones made by claimants, but I'd really encourage you as defendants, uh, once you've assessed the claim, uh, possibly following advice on quantum from counsel, um, make a Part 36 offer, because that lays down an important marker for the claimant and ensures that if ultimately the matter trundles on and goes to trial, um, you have a certain degree of cost protection if you've got the estimation of quantum correct. Um, so, so don't settle bad claims because that might encourage others, but do consider Part 36 offers uh, when appropriate. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please, Christina. So when the claim is issued, uh, what's the first things you're thinking about? First, um, first bubble there, Christina, liability um, and quantum. So again, the claimant comes in um, and, and of course, the first thing you're going to do is sit down and consider the causes of action and ask yourselves, are the claimants likely to be able to prove a breach of the UK GDPR. If there is a breach, is compensation payable? If there are claims under the panoply of heads of challenge, ask yourself, are they adding anything or can they just be struck out? And then thinking about quantum, which Matt will deal with uh, later this afternoon, you might be asking yourself, have they made out causation? Um, is there distress? But if there is distress, has that distress actually been caused by the breach? or is it in part caused by the defendant or by the claimant? Have they failed to mitigate their loss? Um, and is there likely to be any evidence uh, that will uh, support their claim, psychiatric or otherwise? So thinking about all those issues. The four other issues then you're thinking about are first forum, uh, summary disposal, the possibility of funding issues and costs, and I want to talk about the role of the regulator. So first, Christina, if we look at the next slide, uh, we're going to think about forum. Um, so once you've taken a look at the claim, the next question you can ask yourselves is forum. Um, now, of course, claimants regularly try and issue these claims in the High Court. And as Christina indicated, it would be good to, to set out your views on forum in the pre-action uh, stage in advance of any claim being issued. But let's say it does um, get issued in the High Court. Um, what, what's the next thing that we have to consider? Well, first of all, uh, there does seem to be some sort of views from claimant solicitors that actually these cases have to go to the High Court. And that's just not the case because Section 180 of the Data Protection Act gives the, the option of issuing data breach claims in either the County Court or the High Court. Um, and the pre-action protocol uh, for media and communications explicitly applies to all data protection claims and misuse of information claims and indeed breach of confidence claims. And so lots of solicitors say, OK, well, the media communications protocol says data breach claims, high court list, therefore high court. But that pre-action protocol and part 53 has to be read in the context of CPR practice direction 7A, because there at 2.1, it says proceedings, whether for damages or for a specified sum, may not be started in the high court unless the value of the claim is more than £100,000. And so this was also the subject of some really useful comment in the Johnson and Eastlight case that Christina just set out. Um, because in that case, what Master Cornett said was that there was no basis for the claim to have been issued in the High Court. And uh, he set out Practice Direction 7A, uh, relying on it, and then asked himself, is there any feature about this case 
which suggests that it should be elevated to high court status, despite the fact that the, the value of the claim is well below £100,000. Uh, and what he said was, um, you have to remember that when the media communications claim list is talking about a high court claim, um, it's only talking about uh, things like um, that are that are exclusively for the high court. So defamation actions, which are excluded by the county court. Um, but he noted that the claimant's causes of actions did not have to be brought in the high court. Um, and so they are therefore not a, quote, high court claim. So I really encourage you to rely on that particular decision. If you're having any difficulties with claimant solicitors as to uh, the question of forum, and if we go to the next slide though, Christina, um, there may be some circumstances, however, where you may wish to have the claim in the High Court, okay? So you might not automatically always want to divert these claims into the County Court. Um, thinking about some factors, first, uh, predictability. Uh, the County Court can be a little bit more unpredictable than the High Court is. You don't always know what sort of judge you're going to get, and that may be a factor you wish to bear in mind. Similarly, if there is a certain degree of complexity to the claim, um, it, you may think it's actually more suitable for a high court judge who deals with uh, the more complex data protection claims uh, than uh, the county court. And of course, the question of costs will be something in your mind, because if you get it into the small claims track on the county court, uh, then there won't be any cost recoverability. And that can work in two ways, right? Because, of course, the claimant can't recover their costs, but equally, you won't be recovering your costs if you're confident that you have a strong defence. And similarly, the profile might be something you want to bear in mind because, of course, the county court is much lower profile. Uh, so that might keep things under wraps a bit more if you're worried about reputational damage. Uh, you're not going to have sort of a reported judgment in the county court like you would in these high court cases. Um, generally, the courts appear to be taking the view that many of these low level data breach claims are just suitable for the small claims track in the county court. And that's what Mr. Justice Warby said in the Amiol case there in the middle bubble at paragraph 124, uh, and what was said by Master McLeod in the, in the Veal Wasborough case, uh, where, where he said there's no credible case that distress or damage over a de minimis threshold will be proved. And in the modern world, it's not appropriate for a claim, especially uh, for a party to a claim, especially in the High Court, uh, to bring uh, claims of breaches of this sort. So that's um, some case law to bear in mind when you're having a, a, a fight about forum. So moving on then to summary disposal, because uh, when you're considering the question of forum, you may also wish to consider whether the claim merits an aggressive strikeout application, because that's a useful uh, tactic to take. If you think the claim is quite trivial, you don't want to incur the cost of going to trial. Uh, and there's now been a couple of decisions which, which Christina has uh, explained the facts of um, that provide useful insights into this. So first of all, uh, as we've mentioned, Johnson and Eastlight, um, as Christine has already explained, the claim was for misuse of private information, breach of confidence, uh, negligence, which was later withdrawn, together with Human Rights Act and Data Protection Act damages. Uh, and the defendant applied to strike out the claim. Uh, it came before Master Tornet. And the first thing Master Tornet observed uh, was that the information that was disclosed was just routine, not of an obviously sensitive nature in itself. Uh, he observed that the distress claim seemed more in the realms of the unknown or the hypothetical than in reality. You often look at these, these claims and you kind of think, are they genuinely distressed really from this? Um, not to say that there won't be legitimate cases of distress, of course. Um, but interestingly, Master McLeod noted that the fact that the claimant had issued a claim in a publicly identifiable claim form without any attempt to withhold her personal address was evidence that any distress caused by the re revelation of her distress had been, uh, of her address rather, had been diminished because in this case her address had been revealed and here she was uh, filing a claim with her address, uh, which was of course publishable to the world. Um, now, Master Thurnett expressed strong and useful views on the question of allocation, as I've mentioned, but on the question of strikeout, um, he noted that the reference to things like misuse of private information is really just an alternative to Article 8. Um, it entirely overlaps with Article 8. Nothing independent arise, arises from it. So again, useful to, for you to think about when you're thinking about how these claims just have all these heads of causes of act, uh, various causes of action. They're overlapping. They don't do much more. And then looking at the claim as a whole, 
he said that the breach of confidence claim and the claim in privacy fail to satisfy me that they add anything useful and independent to the UK GDPR, um, or the, rather the, just the GDPR breach. Um, and so therefore he struck out uh, those aspects of the claim. But as Christina mentioned, um, he did uh, send the claim uh, back to the county court uh, just for the consideration of the sort of nominal low damages issue. Uh, and there's a quote there uh, on that slide. So if we go to the next uh, case, again, just summary judgment, uh, Veal and Wasper at Wizards. Again, Christine has gone through the facts with you on this. Uh, and what you just need to take away uh, from this um, is that bear in mind, the courts will be robust with these cases. If you have a, a claim that you think is really trivial, uh, then please, please strike it out because that's exactly uh, what happened in Rolf. Um, if we go to the next one, Christina. Uh, so Warren, again, Christina's touched on this one. Um, and in Warren, because it was an external cyber attack, this tells us one or two useful things about how the courts again will approach breach of confidence uh, and misuse of private information. Because what Mr. Justice Saini said in this case uh, was that effectively the claimant's claim is that um, Dixon's failed in alleged duties to provide sufficient security for the claimant's data. And what he said is that is in essence the articulation of some form of data security duty. And in my judgment, neither breach of confidence nor misuse of private information impose a data security duty on the holders of information, um, even if private or confidential. Both are concerned with prohibiting actions by the holder of information which are inconsistent with the obligation of confidence or privacy. And so he said he accepted that a misuse may include unintentional use, but it still requires a use, still requires a positive action. So in, in cases of uh, omission, um, a failure to have proper security, uh, misuse of private information, breach of confidence may be difficult. And you should uh, think about that in the case of any uh, claims arising from a cyber attack. Finally, then, um, it's not all plain sailing with strikeout applications. Uh, as Christina mentioned uh, just there on that slide, Ashley and Ampl Amplifon Limited, um, Mr. Justice Kerr uh, didn't strike it out, deemed that it would be appropriate, even though it might seem trivial, um, uh, it, it is appropriate that uh, the, ca the case um, be heard, but he did transfer it uh, to the county court. Uh, so if we go to the next slide then, that's on strikeouts. I just want to touch on two further matters, which are funding and costs and the role of the ICO. Uh, first on funding, uh, it's important from the outset and throughout the litigation to understand how the claimant is funding their claim because this will assist you in understanding whether and how they will settle. It's often funded by ATE insurance and so that's of course where the claimant will seek to recover the ATE premium from the defendant. ATE premium often matches or exceeds the damages claimed in the action and the thing is as many of you will know ATE premia are not generally recoverable anymore in civil litigation, but there's a carve out for publication and privacy proceedings. Um, but it's important to remember the definition of publication and privacy proceedings um, uh, include misuse of private information and include breach of confidence, but not data protection claims. And that's another reason why it's really, really useful if you can strike out the breach of confidence and misuse of private information claims because then that can cut the claimant down in their tracks in respect of funding. And as well as that, if you get the matter onto the small claims track in the county court where there's no costs recovery, unless a party has behaved unreasonably, again, you force the claimant to reevaluate whether they want to further pursue the claim as the claimant's um, solicitors would be effectively throwing um, good money after bad that they're not going to recover. Most cases are brought on a CFA. In fact, um, I haven't really seen any that haven't been brought on a CFA. Um, the barrister, if there is a barrister, will often be on a CFA too. And in my view, that's often useful when a claim is issued to see if a barrister has done the pleading, um, because that can give you an indication as to whether at least a barrister has looked at it and thought, yes, this is worth my while to take on on a CFA, because you know not all barristers will take on CFAs unless they think there's a good chance of succeeding. So that may suggest there's something, something to the claim and maybe something you want to bear in mind. And then on cost recovery, as I've said, uh, forum's important in that regard. Part 36 offers, which of course won't, um, uh, if you end up on the small claims track, uh, won't work for you. Um, but it's also noticeable that in the Johnson and Eastlight case, which I just referred to, in that case, the claimant filed a precedent H, 
um, and, and had proposed uh, costs in excess of £50,000. Again, remember Christina talked about this case, very, very, not a very um, significant data breach. And what Master Thornett said there was that no seriously privately paying litigant would contemplate spending over £50,000 in costs, not all of which may uh, prove recoverable, even the event, in the event of success, and similarly expose themselves to the risk of a significant adverse cost order following high court litigation if unsuccessful for a damages claim that's worth less than £3,000. And so many of us see this where the damages claim is, is less than far less than £10,000 and yet the costs are ballooning. And what Master Thornton said was this, the presentation and processing of the case to date in this forum has constituted a form of procedural abuse. And again, I think that's a useful thing to draw out if you're having a difficult pre-action pre, um, or um, during the litigation settlement discussions with a claimant and you feel like their costs are the sort of tripping point and are excessive. Finally then, because I know I'm short on time, uh, just touching on the role of the regulator, um, regulators uh, sometimes will get involved in these claims, not the regulator herse himself, um, but uh, the outcome of regulatory investigations. So of course, a data subject might have made a complaint about the breach and uh, they may uh, rely on that. That can have a prejudicial impact on the case, albeit it won't be determinative. Um, second, uh, if the breach was reported by you to the ICO um, under Article 33 of the UK GDPR, uh, you might um, wish to rely on some findings from the ICO um, or comments about your own general compliance with the data protection principles that can assist you. Uh, and thirdly, uh, sometimes the ICO, once the breach is reported, will is issue a monetary penalty for a breach. That's likely to be appropriate uh, in those types of cases um, uh, if you're appealing that monetary penalty to, to stay the, the civil claim until uh, the appeal in the information tribunal is determined. Uh, and that, that was done actually in the Warren case, which we've talked about already. So I've um, gone over my time, apologies to Matt, but I'm going to hand over to the topic that I think most of you are most interested in, which is uh, amounts uh, you should be settling for compensation. Thanks very much, John. So as the slide suggests, there are two questions really, I think in this final part of the session, when is compensation payable and how much should we pay? So the first question, if we go over to the next slide, in theory, compensation is payable for any infringement of the UK GDPR, which results in either financial or non-financial loss. That's what Article 82 of the UK GDPR and Section 168 of the DPA 2018, when they're read together, that's what they say. Now, let's start with financial loss. It doesn't tend to come up as often uh, in these cases, in my experience, but what kinds of financial loss could be raised? Well, firstly, fraud. After a personal data breach, it's quite common to see a complaint about the data subject being exposed to the risk of fraud. But I've never dealt, um, never dealt with a case where anyone has actually suffered uh, financial loss in this way. Now, a good tactic that I've seen um, clients use quite effectively, you can deal with the risk of fraud um, by offering to cover the cost of registering with CFAS, that's C-I-F-A-S. They run a uh, protective registration service and it costs only £25 for two years coverage, which is a pretty negligible cost, uh, but one which importantly, from my perspective, shows goodwill. Um, secondly, you might also see a claim for lost earnings, often where the data breach or whatever it is has occurred in the context of an employment dispute. And the Ashley versus Amplifon case is an example of, of that. And you've, you've heard both John and Christina talk about that. Now, it's not entirely clear, I think, to what extent employment issues can be folded into a data protection claim. And quite often, if you look at the facts closely, they're actually raising issues that are separate, unrelated to the impact on the data subject of the personal data breach. But we've got to bear in mind that in personal injury law, where a claimant's earning capacity has been affected as a result of an injury, uh, usually a diagnosed uh, psychiatric injury, in principle, they can recover damages for lost earnings. And now that has the potential to really uh, inflate the value of the claim. Those I think will be fairly rare, but, and, and, and this is an important point to take away. Damages for loss of earnings resulting from distress only, so something short of a diagnosed injury, uh, you don't generally recover um, damages for loss of earnings in those cases. You might also, oh, sorry, Christine, we haven't quite moved over. You might also see a claim for time spent 
dealing with the effects of a personal data breach or perhaps chasing up a late subject access request. Now, this was more significant in the pre-GDPR era when the law, well, until mid 2010s, was that you couldn't claim damages for distress unless you'd suffered some kind of financial loss. And the workaround for that was, well, award a nominal sum, often for time spent on the case, that's a financial loss, and that opens the door to a claim for, damage, a claim for damages for distress. That's no longer necessary uh, under the UK GDPR. And so it doesn't come up as often as a result because it's not, um, it's not as crucial strategically to the case. But um, it does come up from time to time. And you'll see from the Rolf case what Master McLeod said about the claimant's exaggeration of the amount of time that they spent dealing with the incident in that case. Now, the same is probably true of out-of-pocket expenses. So um, if we go over then to non-financial loss, um, the vast majority of cases I deal with tend to, be, tend to focus on non-financial loss and usually uh, claims for distress, but it doesn't have to be limited to distress. There are other types of non-financial loss which can be raised. Now, I've already mentioned psychiatric and physical harm. Now, I've certainly dealt with many cases where at the pre-action stage, they've gone to a, a doctor uh, who's produced a medical report uh, and it's submitted with the pre-action letter. Now you need to read it carefully for the point that I made on the previous slide, because you need to see whether it actually does confirm a diagnosis or perhaps a worsening of a recognized medical condition, because then that potentially does open the door to personal injury damages. But they don't always, sometimes they'll, it's sometimes quite difficult to see, but sometimes they'll, go, they'll stop short of saying, well, there's actually a recognizable psychiatric condition here. It's clear, however, that the claimant has suffered distress. Well, distress is different from psychiatric injury for, for our purposes. Now, usually the case, the issue raised in the report is a psychiatric injury, but I have dealt with at least one case where the claimant complained that they'd injured their back as a result of documents going missing from their personnel file. Make of that what you will. So another aspect of non-financial loss that might be claimed for is loss of control over personal data. Now, this was an important issue that was dealt with by the Supreme Court in Lloyd versus Google. And the court there confirmed that you can't claim damages for loss of control uh, over your personal data under the DPA unless you've also suffered financial loss or distress. So the difficulty for Mr. Lloyd in that case is that he couldn't, he didn't have any evidence because he was bringing a representative case um, of any damage or distress. And in fact, his whole case was set up uh, to try and avoid having to do that and the, and the Supreme Court rejected um, that approach. Importantly though, that's, that's just limited to the Data Protection Act. Damages for loss of control of um, private information are available if the claim is brought or if it includes a claim for misuse of private information. But as the Supreme Court also emphasised in Lloyd, the DPA covers personal data and personal data um, is anything really relating to the individual. It doesn't make a distinction between um, anodyne or everyday information and private. Well, obviously it does, but it covers everything. The tort of misuse of private information only protects information about which the claimant had a reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, so that potentially limits the scope of um, damages for non-financial loss. Let's move now to distress, as this is the main one. As I said, this is um, usually the emphasis of claims. And by distress, I'm talking about emotions, emotions like shock, anxiety, frustration, a feeling that your dignity has been violated or your reputation has been harmed in some way. Now, as I'll discuss in the, in the next part of this um, talk, it's actually incredibly difficult to put a value on those feelings for obvious reasons. Now, crucially, um, the right to claim uh, compensation for distress is limited uh, by this principle, the de minimis principle. Um, it's a threshold uh, that the claimant needs to cross and it will only be crossed where the impact of the data breach or, or whatever infringement is relied on is significant. And if we move over, I'll try and unpack what, what we mean by de minimis or what the courts have told us about de minimis. So it's featured quite prominently uh, in the case or in the last few years, particularly after the case of TLT, which I will come on to. Um, now, uh, recent decisions have been, I think, particularly encouraging for defendants in this kind of litigation. So in the court, in the Lloyd litigation in the Court of Appeal, even though the decision of the Court of Appeal was overturned, 
by the Supreme Court, I think this observation still holds good, uh, which is that a claim for damages for a one-off accidental breach that's quickly remedied would, in the words of um, the Chancellor of the, well, I can't remember which uh, court he's a Chancellor of, would undoubtedly, that's the crucial, crucial word, undoubtedly be de minimis. And a lot of the cases that we're dealing with do fall into that category. Now, I think that, to be honest, the court might have um, overstated that because, as we've seen from cases like Ashley and Amplifon, even accidental one-off quickly remedied breaches sometimes throw up tribal issues. But that's a pretty encouraging uh, principle to, to cling on to. So secondly, just because information relates to a person's private and family life does not automatically mean it's going to be protected by the law. And the courts will uh, expect people to adopt uh, a reasonably robust and realistic approach to living in the 21st century. That's from the Ambrosiadu case uh, that Christina mentioned, Ambros Ambrosiadu versus Coward, 2011 Court of Appeal case. So information that is of slight significance, generally expressed, anodyne, all languages from all, all uh, phrases from that case, unlikely to cross the de minimis threshold. So um, uh, and John's example from uh, the Johnson case where the claimant said, well, my address is very sensitive, but she put it on her claim form. That the kind of information that people routinely give out unthinkingly is probably not likely if it goes, if it's a subject of a data breach to cross the de minimis threshold. Um, finally, on this point, um, these, well, the Rolf case, which John and Christina have, have already talked about, I think is a, <clears throat> a really good illustration of de minimis in action. So the claim was described as frankly trivial um, because minimally significant information was given out, nothing especially personal. The disclosure was to a single person and it was quickly deleted. Now, if you are looking for even more guidance on this topic, on the, on the subject of de minimis, you, you could do well to look at the cases on misuse of private information and recent defamation cases, because in both contexts, the courts will apply what they call us, they, they will expect to see what they call a certain level of seriousness uh, in order for a claim to succeed. And quite often you'll see allegations in these kinds of cases rejected for being trivial. Now, some of my favourite examples involve uh, the former premiership footballer and podcaster Peter Crouch. And he's been involved in some of the phone hacking litigation against the Mirror. Uh, but sadly for him, two articles that were published allegedly as a result of his phone being hacked were rejected by the court as not meeting the required level of seriousness. Now, the first uh, article was a picture of him on a day out at Alton Towers. Uh, with the caption Peter Crouch and his girlfriend Abby Clancy looking petrified on the roller coaster ride at Alton Towers. That was rejected as being trivial. And, and an earlier example uh, was an article uh, about his custom made seven foot bed, also rejected as trivial. So let's move on to the, the question, the burning question of the day um, how much should you pay? Now, I'm assuming. And in most cases, this is true. Liability is admitted. Compensation is payable in principle. Question is, how do we value these claims? So if we um, can actually just uh, just before we flick over, I looked, I tried to provide you with the most comprehensive answer I could. And so I've trawled the Internet for cases and my searches threw up more than 500 cases going back more than 20 years. But of those, only a tiny handful, 14 by my count, actually featured an award of damages for a breach of data protection law. Now that's interesting because despite the right of compensation being on the statute book since the DPA 1984, it barely featured in litigation until the last few years. Now the earliest example I could find was in the Naomi Campbell litigation of the early 2000s and she was awarded two and a half thousand pounds as a result of the photo that was taken of her leaving a Narcotics Anonymous meeting for distress, injury to feelings. But it's really in the last nine or 10 years that we start to see the most of these cases. Um, now, needless to say, the cases are all over the place. There's no authoritative, authoritative statement in any of them about how we go about calculating the value of a data protection claim. However, it is possible, I think, to piece together at least three general principles, and they're on the next slide. So firstly, Awards uh, of compensation are not supposed to be substantial in a data protection context. That's what the Court of Appeal said 
in Halliday versus Creation Consumer Finance, a 2013 case. Now, in my experience, many of the solicitors firms who have jumped on the GDPR bandwagon don't appreciate this point. They tend to massively inflate their clients' expectations for a payout, and that does, in reality, make it difficult to settle these claims sometimes. Secondly, and Christine has alluded to this already, multiple causes of action, normally everything is chucked in, uh, into a, into a pre-action letter, into a particulars of claim. In the majority of cases, I think it's not going to make a difference, particularly where we're referring, where the claim as a whole arises from the same incident with the same consequences for the claimant. So generally speaking, it won't matter which cause of action is relied on. But as both John and Christina have said, I think the trend in the, in the very recent case law is these claims now have to be brought under the DPA. The final uh, point to make before we put, uh, put my money where my mouth is, is if you don't know any of the other cases on this issue, look at TLT versus the Home Office, 2016 High Court case. This case is so helpful because it involved a number of claimants who had each received different awards of comp compensation. And so it can be taken as setting an informal tariff. Uh, and TLT was expressly relied on in that way by a 2020 High Court case called ST versus L Primary School. Um, and this is the approach I would normally take when I'm asked to advise and defend these types of claims. So those are the principles. Let's look at, uh, let's look, get the pound signs on the page. So been trying, I've been a little ambitious on this page. The point is to try and illustrate where um, the courts have pitched different types of scenario. So in TLT, you can see in the top right corner, the very highest award in that case, 12 and a half thousand pounds. Now, if you don't know this case, if you're not familiar with it, it was the accidental publication of uh, private personal uh, data about asylum seekers. These are people who had fled, or at least claimed to have fled persecution uh, from their home countries. And six of the about 1500 people who were affected sued the Home Office. Now, unsurprisingly, liability was admitted. Um, and the judge accepted the, all of the claimants' evidence that they'd been deeply shocked and put in fear for their own and their loved one's safety as a result of the breach. Now, the reason why I've put, uh, you can see actually on the graph, all three of these TLT awards on the more serious side of the line is because for me, this is about as serious as it will get in the majority of cases. So serious that not only did the Home Office have to notify the ICO, they actually made a statement to Parliament. Now, the majority of cases are not going to be as serious as that. So at the top end, in the top right hand corner, twelve and a half thousand pounds for claimants where the breach had serious effects, they'd had to relocate and they'd live with genuine and rational fears for the safety of their relatives back home. In the middle of the band, there was an award of six thousand pounds. And this was for someone who'd have suffered acute shock and nagging fear for two and a half years that they could be uh, persecuted if they were removed back to their home country. Towards the bottom end, £3,000 for someone who'd suffered an unpleasant shock, which only lasted for a few months. Now, as I say, I think this is about as serious as it gets. So in my view, it would generally be safe to treat £12,500 adjusted for inflation, this is a six-year-old case, as representing about the top end of a likely award. Now, there are there is at least one example of a case that exceeded that, but that was pretty exceptional. So I think that's generally going to set a ceiling on these kinds of awards. It's generally around the £3,000 mark and below that we're going to be looking at mostly for these kinds of cases. And remember that £3,000 here was awarded to two claimants in TLT. Uh, they were both extremely vulnerable. One of them had a diagnosis of PTSD. The other one had been um, a victim of domestic abuse and forced into prosecution and trafficked into the UK. So again, it's unlikely that the kinds of claimants you'll be dealing with will have suffered in that way. They won't be as vulnerable. Uh, so the majority of cases, I think, will be substantially less serious than £3,000. Now, I'm sorry we're running a little bit over time. Um, I'm going to try and wrap this up quickly, but I think it's important to cover these, um, these cases off. So what other benchmarks are there? I've already mentioned the case of ST versus L Primary School. Um, this was a case where a uh, head teacher sent a letter to the parents of all children in year five. Uh, it was well intended, but it revealed that um, ST had a diagnosis of autism and there'd be no parental consent for that. 
Um, so again, fairly unusual case in that it involved processing special category personal data of a child, which was obviously going to make it more serious. There were two awards in this case you'll see from the slide, £1,500 to the child herself. Now, she wasn't aware of the breach. She was only nine or ten. Um, so she couldn't have suffered any distress. But she had uh, a claim, an award was made under misuse of private information for the loss of control of her private information. That was £1,500. £3,000 was awarded to her mother, um, even though it wasn't the mother's personal data that had been disclosed. So she recovered damages under um, Article 8 of the uh, ECHR. And that was on the basis that um, her daughter's condition of autism was, uh, and her concerns about her daughter were key to her personal integrity and well-being. So she was a very, very um, protective mother who was deeply affected by the disclosure. So again, relatively serious cases. Um, there's the case of Crook versus Chief Constable of Essex Police, such from 2015. Um, now, this was a pretty um, outrageous case in some ways. The claimant was published in a press release by the police as being one of the 10 most wanted suspects in the county and that he was wanted for an alleged rape. Now, at this time, he hadn't even been spoken to by the police, and I don't think he was even aware that the complaint had been made against him. Um, and the court said, well, that was clearly unnecessary, unreasonable, disproportionate to, to publicly shame him in that way. And it took almost three years to remove references to it from the internet. Now, in this case, Mr. Crook had suffered a, a psychiatric injury and he was given £5,000 for that. But more relevantly for our purposes, he was given £2,000 for distress, which I found a little bit surprising for someone publicly accused of rape in that way, perhaps affected by the fact that he had recovered for psychiatric, psychiatric injury. But again, it's a pretty low level, £2,000. In that case, you might also want to note that the police had to pay £3,000 in aggravated damages for the way that they had gone about it. And crucially, that included a failure to apologise. Now, a case that was new to me until I was preparing for this session is a Scottish case in the Sheriff Court. Now, that's equivalent to an English county court called Bates, B-E-Y-T-S, versus Trump International Golf Club Scotland. Now, to add to um, Donald Trump's legal woes, he was, or his golf club, was uh, sued by a woman who suffered from urinary incontinence and she had had her photo taken by an employee of the golf club when she had to go for a wee on the presidential golf course um, and the photo was passed to the police. Now she complained rightly that this was a massive invasion of her privacy and the judge was pretty annoyed about it but unfortunately for the claimant she hadn't framed her case properly. For some reason she picked on the fact that the club allegedly wasn't registered with the ICO. That had nothing to do with the uh, photograph or, or the effects of the photograph on her. So she didn't get any damages. But helpfully, the judge said, well, if the case had been properly framed, he would have given her £750 in damages. Now, I think that's quite a helpful benchmark. Um, it's less than £1,000. Still, a, it's still an invasion of privacy. Uh, so fairly serious, um, but it's not excessive. I think it's quite uh, an interesting benchmark. The last one worth mentioning, I've already referred to the Halliday case. Um, this was an award of £750, essentially for um, frustration at how long this uh, the personal data breach in that case had taken to resolve. I think in that case it was a period of about four months where the uh, defendant had had a note on file saying that Mr Halliday owed them £1,500 under a credit agreement, which wasn't true, and they also passed that information to a credit reference agency. Um, okay, one more case worth mentioning on the slide, AB, uh, it's just popped up on the screen. This one's a bit of an outlier, not, not least because it was a claim not for a personal data breach, but for a delay, fairly significant delay, it has to be said, in uh, responding to a SAR, subject access request. Um, there's absolutely no explanation in the judgment about how £2,250 came to be awarded. Um, the court accepted that the claimant had suffered distress and there was no medical evidence. Um, I think in the light of more recent case law, AB was a case from 2014, that's way too high, but the problem uh, really is it's the only case, the only reported case of an award of damages for delays in processing a SAR. And uh, in at least one case I dealt with in the last month, the judge took that as the benchmark for um, 
assessing damages, even though I think it's too high. Um, so quickly to wrap up, three lessons I take from this sample of cases. Firstly, there's very little science involved in valuing these, in these claims. It's really a case of comparing and contrasting with the cases that are out there in the public domain. Secondly, as the graph illustrates, most of the time for genuine cases, you'll be looking at an amount of compensation in the region of about £1,000 or less. And uh, the cases that exceed that amount are, the, for the most part, more serious than the run of the mill cases that we tend to see most often. My final lesson is that you should pitch your offers on the low side, I think, because of the risk that your case might set a precedent for future cases because there's such a limited sample out there. OK, let's move on to questions. Thanks very much for listening so far. Um, what policy should controllers adopt to reporting personal data breaches to the ICO? Who wants to tackle that one as quickly as you can? Um, I'll just tackle that. It's something I touched on really there um, in terms of uh, you have to follow Article 33 of the UK GDPR, basically. So that's where you look to for that question. You need to be um, basically reporting breaches that are um, any breaches that may result in a risk to the rights and freedoms of an individual, effectively, is what that says. So they're, they're the breaches you need to be reporting. OK, thanks, John. Our next question is, will routinely agreeing to low level payouts only encourage more claims? I think it probably depends on what kind of organisation you are. Um, if you are likely to have a lot of repeat customers and you'll see from a lot of the case or the MOJ features quite uh, a lot in um, in these kinds of cases. I do a fair amount of work for MOJ in this area. They obviously have a huge prison estate and you know things things do happen. And one of the concerns might be, well, if if someone on the wing learns that their neighbor has got a payout, maybe they might look into to bringing a claim. So I think you've got to be careful about setting a precedent. But ultimately it's a strategic decision. It's going to be it's going to differ between organizations. Is it worth paying a bit of money, paying a nuisance value to get rid of the claim, or is it worth, um, as John suggested, or as Christina suggested, taking a risk on litigation and trying to get it knocked out to discourage others? If, if I can just add to that, I think um, you may also be aware that there are quite a few of those um, online forums where people sort of share the amounts of money that they were able to um, uh, obtain uh, in settlement and things like that. So. Um, it, it might have that effect of, of adding to uh, an even more litigious um, culture in this area. Great. Thank you, Christina. Can we claim LPP over our investigation or review of a personal data breach? John, do you want to pick up on that? I think in principle you can, if, if the lawyers are obviously the people who are um, engaged in advising uh, about the, the personal data breach. Um, there, there certainly will be aspects that will be covered by litigation privilege, yeah. Great. Um, can claimants use CFAs? I think actually, John, you've probably covered that question. If we go over the, to the final slide. And I think, John, you've also dealt with um, pre-action protocol for media and communication claims, media and communications list. I think it's going to be much more difficult to make the argument to get these cases in the High Court in the light of the cases we've been discussing today. Here's an interesting one. Do recent cases mean that the risk of successful claims against controllers has reduced? What do we think? I don't think I don't think it does um, mean that it has reduced because, of course, um, I think you still have the cost risk that you have to bear in mind with these types of, of cases. That even if you are getting things struck out like misuse of private information, breach of confidence, there are still low value data breach claims that claimants are trying to get into fast track or multi-track in the, in the county court. And I think anecdotally, anecdotally succeeding in doing that. And so there's still a significant cost risk um, that arises. Thank you, John. Have you seen claims challenging the sharing of information between organizations? Um, I think John partly touched on this, that often people make the mistake of thinking that the only basis for uh, processing data and in particular sharing personal data is consent well that's clearly wrong and where you're sharing information with another organization is often particularly for public authorities there's obviously going to be uh, um, public task lawful basis available it might be contractual basis all sorts of other reasons to justify sharing so that's that kind of complaint is often the result of 
misunderstanding. Um, but data sharing is a tricky area. There's a bespoke uh, doc guidance document from the ICO. It's always worth making sure that you, you have done it correctly and you've, you've shared it only with the people that need to know. Final question then, what about Lloyd versus Google? Do we have any comments on that? Um, just, I mean, you've, you've obviously explained um, what that case was about. I think I would just add that one can take the view that because that case was concerned um, with the old regime, so the 1998 um, DPA, I think it's, it's fair to say on, on the basis of um, the wording of the UK GDPR and the 2018 um, uh, DPA, specifically um, section that's Article 82 and Section 168, I believe, um, that it probably has relatively little relevance for the, for the current regime, um, but it includes interesting points on the distinction between um, misuse of private information and other causes of action. All right. Well, uh, Christina, John, thank you very much. And to you uh, for listening, thank you very much as well. Um, I think this has been a... Um, really interesting session for me and I hope you've learned at least something now then we want we would be interested to know if there's an appetite for another session on this topic so if you do have um, questions that we didn't cover or other things that you think would be interesting for us to talk about please do let us know I believe you'll get an email uh, in due course asking for feedback um, and that's always really helpful um, so thank you very much for joining us and we'll end the webinar there thank you <laughs>